The following video is pretty explicit in terms of delivery-related medical events and anatomical terminology. If any of that makes you uncomfortable for whatever reason, totally okay, but maybe skip this one. Hey everyone, quick teaser, this video features bad preeclampsia, laboring for 35 hours, overdosing on magnesium, postpartum hemorrhage, and more. The villain of the story is my placenta, twice, it tried to get me twice, and the hero is a guy named Daniel, so thanks again Daniel if you ever see this. Also, if you've been missing Gray, Hey everybody, uh, it's Gray, uh, it's been a minute since I've been here, but um, hopefully it's a pleasant surprise to see me again. They'll be making a couple of cameos to share a handful of cute happy memories from delivery day. Can you believe that we have been parents for a whole year now? How wild. In honor of the twins' birthday, I thought I would take a quick break from research video essays and share my birth story. It's long and dramatic, so I'm just gonna get right into it. I had made it to 36 weeks and one day pregnant when one evening I was having a little pukey episode over the toilet as I often did in the third trimester, and afterwards I noticed a small puddle on the floor. Gray and I called the nurse line and talked to a gentleman named Daniel. I said, Daniel, I know this sounds silly, but I'm not sure if I accidentally peed myself or if my water broke just now. That's right folks, it's the classic pregnancy game. Pee or baby. Pee or baby. Oh, I guess we just don't know this time. He said just to be safe, go to the hospital. And thank goodness he did. It turns out my water was not broken. Uh, I did in fact pee myself, but my blood pressure was scary high. They ran some tests and found out I had preeclampsia. For those unfamiliar, preeclampsia is a condition characterized by high BP, excess protein in the urine, indicating kidney problems, sometimes dropping platelet levels in the blood, and a few other things, but I just had the aforementioned symptoms. The exact cause of the illness is unknown, but many doctors believe it's related to poorly functioning blood vessels in one's placenta. And if left untreated, preeclampsia can advance to eclampsia, which is bad news. Eclampsia means seizures, sometimes stroke, coma, and even death. So that's obviously not great, and it made sense when the docs told us we were going to induce at that point. But I'm gonna let Gray tell that part. So we had been there for at least like five or six hours at this point, and I know I was getting a little anxious and maybe even like slightly annoyed because it was like, all right, are we doing this thing or are we going home? And then this doctor came in that just came on shift and she was like one of our absolute favorites. She was such a gem. And she sat down and just like kind of looked at us and with a big sigh went, I think it's time we get those babies out of you. And then Ash and I just looked at each other and like went, and uh, she's like, so this is good news? And we're like, yeah, we want to meet these kids. And we were so excited. After we had made it past 36 weeks, we knew that we were in safe territory for them and we were so ready to meet them. The reason that we liked this Dr. M was because we had gotten the opportunity to kind of get to know her uh, through when we were trying to get pregnant, through the pregnancy itself, and then to have her be the one to tell us that we were um, going to have the kids was really incredible, but not just because she was a great doctor, but because through the entire experience, she was so affirming. She just saw us as two people trying to create a family and she wanted to be part of that experience. She never misgendered us. She really saw us um, in the way that we wanted to be seen and to have that type of care through such a huge moment in your life is incredibly special. So we moved out of triage and into a room where we just kind of played Catan on the Switch and watched movies for a while. At first, I was chillin' because they had assured me that induction would be a breeze since I was already two centimeters dilated, having tons of Braxton Hicks contractions, and I was 80% effaced. Which means that my cervix was already pretty thin and short. Like 80% as thin and short as it should be, during go time. Spoiler though, they were wrong. Induction was anything but a breeze. We started with cervical ripening. I love that I'm talking about this on the internet. We started with cervical ripening. Um, we started with cervical ripening, which involved placing medication directly on my cervix to help it soften and dilate even more. During that phase, they monitored my progress with periodic internal pelvic exams and ouchy bouchy bear, 
Those hurt. They also continued to run regular blood tests. Unfortunately, after 25-ish hours, my preeclampsia symptoms had only worsened and my body had made zero progress in progressing towards labor. Go me. The next step was Pitocin, which is a synthetic hormone that can kickstart contractions. I got an epidural after two hours of being on Pitocin because things were getting uncomfortable, and that's when my contractions started literally going off the charts. You see, this whole time I had three sensors attached to my belly, one for each twin and one for me. They were all connected to a screen where we could see the baby's heart rates as well as what my uterus was up to. At a certain point we would watch as my contractions started to go up, 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 and then they would just hit the top of the monitor where they would plateau for a while and eventually come back down. It didn't really hurt. It was just hecka uncomfy and rock solid, like a boulder. My stomach was a boulder. It was very weird. Insert Gray's thoughts on this. Your belly, when you had contracted, it felt like concrete. And I tell you, you had contractions all the time. Ash's like stomach was constantly just like hard. It felt like Ash was purposely flexing as hard as they possibly could. And it was just like, you couldn't push in. There was like no give. And it was weird because uh, you had like, we, you had such high Braxton Hicks that it was hard to uh, know if it was a real contraction or not, especially even after we started uh, into like the laboring process. So a Braxton Hicks contraction is your body essentially practicing doing contractions. So it's not actually doing anything uh, to actually get the fetuses out, but what it's doing is essentially having your belly practice the actual muscle movement, but it's not actually progressing anything. Additionally, I was super allergic to the gel that was applied to the belly sensors. It made me red and itchy for weeks after. Here's a clip of that. I just want you to know that this is why I need a scratchy or a toothbrush because Ash is now using my toothbrush. I'm allergic to the gel. They said I'm like the only person ever to be allergic to the gel. Look so how dirty that is. Yeah. So this is why I need somebody to bring me a toothbrush. He's scratching it. Yeah. Anyway, for the next 10 hours, I am napping, changing positions, having blood tests, and eventually some folks come into the room to put Velcro pads around my bed and they're like, oh, don't worry. This is just in case you start having seizures. You're welcome, bye. And I'm like, oh, thanks, that's terrifying. Finally, the resident doc walks in and does one last pelvic exam. She says, well, you are three centimeters dilated now and somewhere between 80 to 90% effaced. So nothing's really happened. Then with something that looks like a crochet needle in her hand, she says, we're going to manually break your water. But before we do, you should know that your condition has advanced to preeclampsia with severe features. Your platelets suck and your kidneys are struggling. She didn't say it like that, but that was the message. Then she raises her hook and is like, you're ready? But I say, wait, no. <laughs> it's my understanding that if my platelets get too low, we could reach a point where it becomes dangerous to perform a C-section. Is that right? She goes, right. And I say, I've also heard that laboring on magnesium is really shitty. Is that true? To which she said, yeah, it can be. Magnesium is a treatment used for folks with preeclampsia. It prevents seizures, but it can make folks feel significantly wiped out, almost like they have the flu. Since since I was already really scared of the intensity of a vaginal twin birth, I did not like the idea of going through it zonked and miserable. On top of that, I felt really worried of being put in a position where I might need an emergency C, but having it be too late because of my platelets. So that's when I asked if we could talk about pivoting to a C-section as our next step. The resident doc said yes, got the attending, we discussed it, and all decided that was a good idea. Then no joke, five minutes after we decided to go for the C, they were rolling me into the operating room. It was fast. As soon as we decided uh, to do a C-section, it was like we had gone to a different hospital. One where everything moves extremely quickly. Everything just is like all systems go. I think from the moment that we decided to do the C-section to me getting dressed into my, into my, like my gown to go into the operating room was maybe like six minutes, which is, so weird when the, all you've been doing for 30, I think 30 some odd hours at that point 
is just sitting around waiting for something to happen. And in all of that waiting, keep in mind that we had, I think, played Catan, we had played cards that I had bought from the gift shop, we had done cat trivia, we had watched movies, and as like the support person, it was interesting because one, first of all, not like I'm really the priority in this situation, but it is hard on the support person because there's like no comfortable area to sleep. You actually, they can't even give you medicine if you get like a headache or anything like that, or you're sleep deprived. You have zero attention that you're not their patient. So you can't really get any assistance. You have to go and get it for yourself, which is understandable, but you need to be prepared for that. And then additionally, you're seeing your partner, the person that you love, you know, most in this world, you know, in a lot of pain, really uncomfortable. It's something that their body is going through. It's really scary. And your responsibility is to help them through this. And that's a lot of pressure and it's a lot of adrenaline and it's, it's just like a lot, it's really overwhelming. But at the same time, I had been gearing up for this for the last eight and a half, you know, months, uh, even longer because when we knew Ash was gonna carry. And so while it was almost surreal to be in that moment because you had, you had formulated and thought about what this was gonna be like for so long and then to be in it was really surreal. It went through these moments of really scary, to really boring, to a little frustrated, to really excited. And I think a lot of that emotional roller coaster is what makes that experience um, so memorable, but also really difficult. In the OR, it was cold and I was anxious. So my body started to uncontrollably shake quite a bit which was odd, but the providers told me that was normal. They put anesthesia in my epidural and they explained what I could expect during the procedure. They said it would only take 10 to 15 minutes to get the babies out, but then 45 minutes to put me back together. A lot of this I already knew because Gray and I had taken some parenting and birthing classes beforehand. They also told me that I shouldn't feel much, just some ambiguous pressure, pushing, pulling, shifting, but no pain. However, as soon as they made the first cut with the scalpel, I reflexively yelled stop because it hurt. I could feel the slice, it stung, and that severely freaked me out for the rest of everything that was gonna happen. In response, they ramped up my anesthesia and said I should try using nitrous the whole time. Nitrous is like a laughing gas that you breathe in with a mask. I didn't really love the way it made me feel, but the nurses said that it would also help with the shaking, so I used it and it did. After the increase in meds, things got better, but the experience was still so strange. I don't know if I'm just weird because I've never heard anyone else say this before and I've watched a lot of c-section birth stories on YouTube, but I could like feel everything. It was not the ambiguous pressure they promised. I could specifically tell if folks were cutting versus sewing versus grabbing a baby or moving an organ. It was so surreal to in detail feel hands in my body and experience my insides being shuffled around in a way they weren't really supposed to be. The whole sensation of it kind of broke my brain and I started violently puking. So while I am open on the table, while they are pulling children out of me, I am having to turn my head to the side and puke in a bag. And I would switch from nitrous to puke to nitrous to puke over and over. I was a mess. But all that mattered in the end was for each baby to come out healthy, and they did, with the first twin weighing five pounds and 11 ounces and the second weighing six pounds even. When I saw those stinkers for the first time, it was so beautiful and I definitely ugly sobbed and then probably puked and then took a hit of nitrous. After that though, there was still a lot to go, again, 45 minutes to put me back together, but it was like a wave of euphoria and relief. Gray was also ecstatic, but they obviously have a totally different perspective. When Ash was rolled away for their C-section, I got escorted down to this really weird hallway. The hospital was under construction. And so I was just on this bench. Usually there's like a specific room, but because there was construction, I was just on this bench. And so everyone just saw me in full scrubs, looking extremely nervous, like very much uh, jittery. And uh, I had my phone and I remember a really good uh, friend of mine and a mentor of mine called me because I had said like, hey, we're, we're going for it. Um, we're going to do the C-section. And she just said, you are going to be a parent that loves their children. You're gonna be somebody that supports them no matter what. And you're gonna be someone that loves them through the hardest of times. 
And that's the best thing that any kid could ever hope for. And I think in that moment, I started to settle. I hung up and I just tried to sit in that feeling. I thought of my dad who uh, passed away and wondered what he was thinking before I was born. I thought about my mom and everything that we had been through. And I thought about how my future children that were only, you know, a few minutes away and how much I was going to love them. And I thought about Ash and wished that I was there during that scary part, but also knew that they were strong and a badass. And I just couldn't wait to get there. And then when I finally saw somebody give the, the this way, I'm pretty sure like I skipped for a second, but then I thought that's weird. And then I just quickly walked. When I walked into the delivery room, they like beeline you to a certain area because they don't want you to see like uh, like some of the operation that's already started. That's what they don't tell you because the operation already starts before the support or the other parent walks into the room. And we had so many people because we were having twins and each twin has a team. And so I was kind of felt like, uh, I don't know if this makes sense, but I almost felt like the, I don't know, second gentleman or the first lady or whatever uh, of this orchestration where people knew I was there, but obviously the focus was on Ash, which is what it needed to be. But I could tell that the nurses and the staff and the doctors were all taking in my experience as well. And that's really weird. And I remember holding, uh, like putting my hand by your face, Ash, and, and like just talking through everything that you needed to hear. And then I remember, and I don't think I'll ever forget it, was them saying like, Here, I think they said, um, here's baby A and they held them up. And I remember hearing their cry and I think Ash and I just both breathed this sigh of relief when we heard that. And I immediately just like lost it. But then they were bringing them over and I think I saw their ears and I said, they have my ears, <laughs> which is so <laughs> weird. And I just remember going through that process and I immediately went over to them because uh, that's what Ash and I had talked about. My job was to make sure that the kids were okay, communicate that back to Ash, and uh, and keep Ash informed through that process. And then I swear, it wasn't even a minute. They told me it was gonna be like five minutes in between. It was 30 seconds. And they'd look over and say, and they said, um, mom, look over here. And then our other child was born and I just like remember hearing them cry and being like, like again, another sigh of relief and it was just this magic. And then I essentially just bounced in between doing everything. Um, the cutting of the umbilical cords, signing all the documents. And I remember it said patient name. And then they're like, you don't sign there, you're the parent. And I was like, oh yeah, that's right. And that was, that was weird. And then, just making sure that they were okay, getting their weights, checking everything, and just then going back and communicating with Ash that they were okay. And Ash had been so sick and just checking on them. It felt like one of the most conflicting things because I'm experiencing all this joy while I'm worried for Ash. But then when I knew Ash was safe, um, it was I was just in tears and um, it was amazing, scary, but then just magical. So we've covered a lot, and I think we're gonna talk about my recovery and the complications that followed in another video. The story is far from over, it's quite the roller coaster, and my placenta is not done causing problems, even though in theory it's supposed to be out of me. But right now, I'm kinda tired. I hope that's okay. Before I go though, I wanna leave you with a little moral. Be your own advocate. No matter how many tests or exams medical professionals perform on you, they cannot feel what's happening in your body. You are the expert on your experience. Doctors and nurses also don't have to live in your body for the rest of life or deal with the consequences of your treatment. You do. So if you think something's wrong or if your care doesn't make sense to you, speak up. You have good instincts and your perspective is valuable. For that reason, you are allowed to ask for help and take ownership in your care. The night I saw the puddle on the ground, I considered not calling the nurse line because I was embarrassed. A part of me did wonder if I just peed and I didn't want to be an inconvenience or overdramatic. But thank goodness Daniel gave me the permission I needed to just go get checked out because why not? That's what medical providers' jobs are anyway, right? To monitor and ensure my health. I think about that night a lot and how it could have gone differently because I didn't have any of the visible symptoms of preeclampsia, which are usually like headache and upper rib pain. 
Also sometimes nausea, but I was having nausea every night, every day since day one, so. Instead, my body was just kind of silently, secretly deteriorating. And in those 35 hours that I was in the hospital, I went downhill fast. What if I hadn't called and just stayed home? Ugh, it like makes me shudder to think about. I'm very happy that I checked in with someone for help. And I'm also happy that I said no to breaking my water and asked for a C-section instead. Maybe that would have been fine, but also, you know, maybe not. And this way was good. During pregnancy, whenever I shared my input or collaborated in directing my care, it always made a positive difference. So I hope to empower you to do the same. Even if you're not pregnant. This can apply to non-pregnant issues as well, obviously. <laughs> you know, duh. That's all for now. Feel free to say happy birthday to my goblins in the comments. There's a tour of their nursery on the second channel if you're interested. And if y'all have the means, please consider becoming a member on Patreon because it is so incredibly helpful for this channel. And yeah, I think that's all. Okay, bye. Wow, you made it to the end. Uh, here is the obligatory part where I ask you to follow me on other social media platforms because it profoundly affects my self-worth. Just kidding, it doesn't really. But, you know, please follow me anyway because that would be fun and I mean fun for my self-esteem. Haha, <laughs> no, not actually. Uh, I am truthfully totally indifferent and if no one follows me, you know, I'm not gonna like cry into a pillow all afternoon. <laughs> I, I did that last Wednesday, so I, I think it's out of my system now. Yeah. Bye.